I think the word of wis- the words of wisdom I have are to really be open to where your your journey can take you because you may have some ideas of what studying design is and where it will take you. I think maintaining an open mind can lead you to some interesting places that may not lead to the title designer or graphic designer, but yet it, your design and your knowledge of design could really inform that in a, in a really interesting way. Briar Levitt's passion is designing for content-driven projects, which started with an interest in museum exhibit design, but eventually led to publishing. She was previously the art director of Bitch Magazine, as well as an independent designer of books. Briar Levitt's feature-length film, Graphic Means, a documentary about graphic design production methods after the letterpress and before the desktop computer, was released in 2019. She is now focusing her work on helping to expand the design history canons to include lesser-heard stories of designers and to tell the critical stories of design and culture. Please join us as we talk with Briar about her work, graphic means, and women in graphic design. Welcome again to another episode of Design Udux Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Bello, here with you. Mandy is with me again as my co-host as we keep working through our guests on redesigning her story. And today we are joined by Briar Levitt. Had I say it correctly? Yes, you did. Oh, whew. I am getting these names down. The more practice, the better. Um... Welcome. It's it's uh it's awesome to have you on the podcast. We've had many discussions. I've I've been out to conferences where I've uh, ran into you. I've seen you speak. Um, everything going well on your side of the the wonderful states. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I this is the room I pretty much live in. It's upstairs and downstairs, and um, to the grocery store. That's pretty much it. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> surviving. So interesting times for sure yeah and um you know it's kind of put us in this mode to have these discussions which has actually been fantastic yeah, so before yeah. we get into some of our questions um you know we talk about documentary films and graphic means and some different things like that a little background on yourself how you got into teaching and what led you to you know wh- where you are today and all the things yeah. that you've done along that path i consider i talk about myself as an accidental professor but i think that it's probably was destined. I came to design as someone who was really in love with museums and wanted to design exhibitions. I thought I wanted to be, yeah, I thought I wanted to be um, a a, a paleontologist or some kind of archaeologist, but it came, I realized, no, actually, I just love the exhibitions and I love the educational experience of being, walking through an exhibition um, and, uh, I, the, the museum that really was the touchstone for me was the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And, um, so museum exhibitions were the starting place for me. And I just think all of the work that I love doing is very sort of content heavy and educational. Um, I ended up going much more into p- publishing and independent publishing. I ended up becoming the um, um, art director for Bitch Magazine, um, and then went to grad school and uh, came back and connected again with Bitch. But um, I became interested in design history um, mostly because I collect a lot of. Um, I, I'm a thrifter, and so I collect a lot of books uh, when I go thrifting. And um, I found myself accumulating more and more and more books that were um, books on uh, graphic design production, mostly from the 80s, some from the late 70s. And um, it was all processes that I was aware of, but that I hadn't done myself as a designer who started learning in 96. Okay. Things Um, are becoming more clear all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it's all sort of connects, but it's, um, it was a journey uh, to get to the point. I mean, there was, you know, as a young designer, if you had told me I was going to be a professor, I would have laughed in your face because I just wanted to design. You know, I just thought that's all I ever want to do. I didn't, I, I didn't want to be an art director. I thought those folks, all they do is email all day and go to meetings Um, and you know, that's what I do now a lot, but I also get to watch students develop and grow and I get to explore my own 
interests and in my own research. So it, it actually couldn't have turned out any better for me. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting the way your career can just um, go in these directions that you didn't expect. And yet they are so, they make so much sense in the right. end for yeah. you. Right. Um, so that's how graphic means. Like when I became a, when I actually first became, when I, when I, um, you know, applied to become a tenure t- track professor, I was a little worried that I didn't have um, the kind of academic chops that were necessary. And I, I didn't think, I thought, what am I going to research? You know, I'm much more of a practitioner. Um, but some, I, I sort of organically found this topic that was very exciting to me. And now I almost worry that I'm losing touch with my, um, you know, this practitioner side of me. So it's always a balance, I think, in academia to, can to, um, keep touch with both sides of yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I'm, love getting a chance to typeset and personally, sure. like typesetting is one of my happy places to be in. Yeah. I'm having some of those similar. I think, I think all of us educators have that moment where we feel like we start to lose touch of our practicing side. Are you still doing uh, work? Are you still practicing? I don't do freelance at this point. Um, I'm doing because I'm working like I'm t- working on two major projects right now. One which is the People's Graphic Design Archive with Louise Sandhouse and Brockett Horn, where we are trying to um, create a cra- well, we are creating a crowdsourced online archive for people to, um, sh- cr- you know, help define what graphic design history is with um, with no gatekeeping. And right now we're, we have it in a prototype phase, but we um, are working on getting an, a partner so that we can really make it something that has a, a home for the foreseeable future. And um, so that's one thing that I'm working on that is sort of I'm obsessed with. And yeah. then another thing is um, I'm working on editing a book of essays um, oh. about women in graphic design that are um, virtually unheard of. I think the most known woman in this book is probably B. Fietler. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's 16 essays. Um, and so those are the two main things that I'm working on. Well, that's gonna be a fantastic piece. We'll, yeah. we'll definitely uh, uh, find some time to talk with you more about that book project. Yeah, and we'll those circle women. back around too. Yeah. Right. Um, in the last episode of the podcast, we did talk with um, Louise and Brockett, and we did mm-hmm. talk about the People's Archive. So if anyone that's oh, listening to this episode, go back and listen to that last episode of the podcast to get a lot more details on that. And if anyone's interested in you know, supporting or uh, getting in touch, please reach out to Briar. Louise or Brockett. Uh, and for just that, go to sure. um, the people's GD archive.org. <laughs> That'll right. work. Right. That'll work. Exactly. Yeah. As, as Pete mentioned, um, we did talk to Louise and Brockett last week, but we wanted to make sure that you got credit for that project too. Um, <clears throat> today though, we, we want to talk specifically about the film that you made, the documentary film you made graphic means. Um, and so I want to give you just an opportunity to talk a little bit about how that got started um, mm-hmm. what made you decide to focus on that project in particular? I, I think we've gotten a few pieces here from your stories about thrifting, but go ahead and, and tell yeah, us a yeah. little bit more about that. Well, I, I, so I'm, I started to have this stack of books and I enjoyed bringing them in. I had a shared office space with some younger designers and, um, I would show them the books I'd show them the, the sort of step-by-step illustrations and photographs um, and say, look, look, this is how it used to be done. And uh, they were floored. And then I, you know, I thought, I should, I should bring this to my class. And then I thought, no, I should, maybe this could be something I do for my, you know, tenure. And I thought, I should do a book. You know, I'm a book designer. I'm a, you know, I should do a publication of something, you know. Then I remembered that I had seen this amazing film called Linotype oh, um, yeah. by yeah. Doug yeah. Yeah, yeah by Doug Wilson and it had like blown open um something that had been total mystery to me for a very long time 
I didn't know two things. One was I just didn't know that Linotype was a machine and not just um, a type foundry. So that was one big thing. The other thing was I remember going into the library and looking at books and going, this book looks like it's letterpress, but how are they still letter pressing books in the 60s? That doesn't make sense to me. Like I, there was no connection for me and I didn't have his, no one, I didn't have a history class at my school in the 90s. Like history is, is, um, you know, it wasn't like a, everyone got a design history class um, up until more recently. And I still think some, some universities don't have it. Oh, for sure. So, so mm-hmm. there were holes in my knowledge. So I, then I saw this film and it blew me away because it both educated me and totally delighted me, like the, the human aspect plus the machine aspect, because I'm, I'm totally interested in machines. So I thought, and then I looked it up and I, or I had seen the movie and I had seen the, the people, uh, he, he hadn't come to Portland, but the uh, cinematographer had. So I had even seen the, some of the makers talking about it. But then I looked it up and it was like, he's a designer. He made like a designer made this film. Maybe I can do this, you know, like he's not a filmmaker. Um, so I started thinking about it, started talking to people and they said, yeah, this is interesting. Like a lot of people my age, uh, um, who Gen X like didn't quite know, or, you know, I'm tail end Gen X 43. And we didn't, we didn't know the details of the, uh, manual processes. Um, and then I said, okay, well, I got to get in touch with Doug Wilson. And he was incredibly generous, um, with he's, he's, he, he was my mentor and, you know, this film almost is like the, you know, sequel to Linotype in so many ways, because it's about the machines and the people, uh, who, and, and the way design was impacted by the machines. So um, that's really how it was able to happen. Like, I don't, I could have done it without Doug, but it was his, you know, that's so much of what we can do is like seeing someone else do it successfully um, before. Right. Um, right. It, did you run into a lot of obstacles then? Can you tell us about, you know, some of sure. the... So when I talk to students about critiques, I ask them to give me an aha moment mm-hmm. and then a mm, not so great moment. So why don't I, why don't I do yeah. the student critique moment with Briar? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I guess the aha moment was just knowing that not only did young people not know, but people my age didn't know. And realizing that um, people who had worked, you know, talking to people um, older than me, I could see they were excited about talking about their right. history. People, I can't tell you how many emails, I mean, now this is after the fact, but I get so many emails where, with the words, this, you made a movie about my life. You know, this movie is, <laughs> you know, and that is so touching. And like, I, I think there's this weird thing where we moved on to the computer and, and we just stopped talking. Like, it was like, no one ever talked about it. I mean, if I had worked in those methods, I'd be saying to students all the time, I'd be talking about it mm-hmm. yes. sort of in the, maybe in the grandpa, grandma way. Like when I was, you know, <laughs> I'll be it, honest with you. I do a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, I, do I do show too. them some rub down funny. type and I bring out lino type oh, and some different, I bring out the photographic blue pencil and I talk to them about paste up. And I, I do that when I was a young designer yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do it intentionally. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I do it now that has, that's how it's informed my teaching is that, I think it helps them to understand how from. design has um, evolved. I think, um, you know, understanding from, you know, printing beginning in China to now, I think it's right. important to know those things. Um, so can you be a good designer without knowing? Absolutely. Does yeah. it help you appreciate what you do? Absolutely. Like people, after they watch Linotype, after they watch Graphic Means, I think they have an appreciation for their tools right. and um, how they uh, work with their tools even better. Um, so when I was in grad school, I actually took a, um, it's called a, a class called pre-production and the instructor of that class, and I took it with a bunch of undergraduate students, but the instructor of that class actually had us um, create paste up with um, 
ruby lith and and you know all of this stuff and um you know non-repro blue and oh, we, we had a waxer we had a we used yep. a waxer and um and so and i thought that was like an incredible experience to just do it um but apparently all the students complained so he no longer <laughs> he he quit doing that um well, which is a little bit disappointing to me as, as a history buff. Um, but yeah. I feel like things like your movie graphic means helps people to, to get that experience when that may not be available to them. Yeah. Well, I was one of those young students that complained. Uh, <laughs> I gra I'm going to date myself. I graduated uh, high school in 86, went right off to college into a visual communication uh, and printing technology course. Uh, and we were thrown into that world. Um, and I, stamping my feet all over the place. Like, did you know that Apple just came out with this amazing computer? We don't have to do this anymore. This is old, This, you know, and so I was, I was one of those students. But that's so. a different period. Like that's the, that's the moment where, that's the period where things were transitioning. I think, I think that the, um, the, the point that it's happening matters, you know, and, and so if, I don't know when you were in grad school, Amanda, but like if I were to, Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if I were to do that now, I think students would get a kick out of it yeah. and they would, you know, especially if they saw, you know, video of people doing it. Um, but that's, by the way, another reason that I chose film over a book is that a lot of these processes, while they're impressive to see in stills as step by step images, by the way, great magazine uh, from the manual era that shows beautiful step by step images. Um, it's, it's so much more impressive to see moving image, um, especially also of some of these machines that you can't really, you know, get a sense of what's happening unless you sort of see someone moving around the machine and everything. Um, so that's just an aside about why I chose another reason I chose film over a book. Yeah. What are some of those, uh, wish you could do differently or obstacles or things that were like, I mean, I'm always seeing things. I wish I could images or pieces, examples. I wish I could put in now, you know, mm -hmm. now that time has passed and I have more at my fingertips, especially with the archive, the people's graphic design archive. I'm like constantly finding examples of things. Oh, I wish I could put this in the movie or like, um, I'm now like in touch with Martin Vanisky. Like I wish I could, have interviewed Martin's oh, sure. his his work is like oh he I've always been a fan um but not a lot I mean I if I had more money you know I could have you know I guess put more money into you know I could have spent more time on editing or more time on um you know added more animation fancier things like that Mm -hmm. Um, but with the money that I had, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I, um, oh, there, there are topics that I didn't fit in there that, you know, I, I wanted to keep it to 75 minutes. I think films are too long now. You know, I think it's out of control how long movies are. Um, and so there's some topics like, uh, the photocopier didn't make it in. And, uh, yeah. I, 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 I wish that made it in. Yeah. Um, that's the main thing. There's other stuff that's more frivolous that didn't make it in, but the photocopier is probably the main thing. I'm like, Oh, I wish that had made it in. Well, uh, Scott, oh gosh, he's going to hate me. Scott bombs from mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, some of the stuff that he's doing in his, um, analog Facebook analog lab. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he's doing some really amazing things too that, you know, could have been, you know, part of that discussion mm -hmm. um, for graphic means as well. It's interesting. How how do you um, decide then, like, what gets cut, you know? is It's hard. I mean, also because, you know, I... Uh, it could go on and on. Like, also, right. Wendy's... Where, where does... Where's the edges of the topic? You know, like, the printing... Uh, you know, I went into pre-press, um, and I had to sort of decide how far to, you know, I basically sort of 
quickly had had uh, Frank Romano quickly explain that printing went up to uh, digital, you know, direct digital output, um, you know, from computer to plate to digital output. But, um, you know, I didn't go to the internet because that, that's just another can of worms. Um, right, right, right. Deciding how far off the, the branches kind of grow, right. you know, before you kind of stop that trail and kind of come back. Right. Sure, so, sure. That makes sense. Because it, it, it was graphic production. So like of a physical object, I guess. Yeah. Is where. So how did you decide who to interview? Well, I'll be honest. It was people I admired. And okay. then at, to start, I mean, Emma Gray was a, I think I told you this before, but Emma Gray was a first, you know, stop for me. And they were very kind and said, we're just, we're shy. We don't, we're not, we, thank you, but we, we, we respectfully decline. Um, and then I asked April about them and got them in there and showed their work. And um, they were also, I ended up meeting Rudy in person at the Letterform Archive and talking to him about some of his stuff and photographing some of their uh, work. But ultimately, it was like people I respected who also filled needs that I that I needed to be covered. You know, I had an outline of things I needed to be covered. Um, I knew also... I also found people that I knew that could speak to these things um, in an articulate way. You know, obviously Ellen Lepton is one of the most articulate, you know, design critics on this planet. So she was on the, and she's just one of the people I look up to as an educator and an author. Um, Frank Romano (laughs) is probably the most known for his background in the printing technology. Right. Yeah. And he really knows about photo, the photo setting world in a way that not many people do and not many people have cared about for so long. He He's had to fight in his own museum to keep photo setting equipment because they're like, this is, you know, like they have all these le- beautiful letter presses and, and they have linotypes and monotype, a monotype or two but they all want to get rid of the the photo setting stuff because it's like plastic. And, yeah. and he's like, no, 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 we're keeping this, you know? <laughs> um, and I think finally by having graphic means it, it, sh- he can say, look, this matters, you know, like, um, but for a lot of people who just care about the, the, you know, the Victorian stuff, it's, mm-hmm. it's like, they don't get it. They're like, right. this thing is a plastic thing. We can't even run it. What good does it do? Um, I wanted to but, ask about, um, and I, I'm looking at my other screen because I want to pronounce his name right, Dan Radigan. Uh, I was really surprised to see Dan in the film, not that I'm discounting it, but, you know, I've I've seen Dan at so many different conferences, and I was like, ah, there's Dan. So he was, that was a last minute interview because someone said, oh, you're in New York, you should, because uh, I was, I was on Twitter and I I was just. I, I started by telling people about this project really early on. Someone I don't even know who now I'm buddies with, um, Indra Kupferschmidt uh, in Germany, said, oh, you're in, you're in New York. You should go interview Dan Radigan. So I got in touch. He, I said he, he was um, head of type design for Monotype at the time. Oh, mm-hmm. I forget his exact title, but he was... He, ha- he was high up in type at, at monotype, at like type design. Yep. He was, he beautifully articulated t- um, ideas about the development of type into phototype that I needed and ideas of the democratization of typography that I needed to be said. I mean, he he's critical. He opens up the film. I mean, that's the funny thing about making a film is that you'll find that people you didn't have originally on your list will end up being the stars of your film. Hmm. Lu- uh, let's see. Well, Lucille was always on my list, Lucille Tanazis, but she was one of my last interviews and I was so tired and I was, it was hot in New York. And it was the, I had, I had been looking in the Ballin archives and, and then I went to see her. I was just tired and I was, but, 
and she, I got into her office before her and, and she came back from lunch and then she was just like this light of energy and, um, and I, it was one of the best interviews I, you know, of the whole thing. So, and, and I just, I, I could watch her scene over and over again. People were like, I could watch Louise talk about paste up mechanicals for hours, you know, because she's so, um, she is so passionate about it and her mechanicals are beautiful, (laughs) you know? So you kind of mentioned this a little bit, um, but, uh, did you have a lot of people who declined to interview you? You mentioned the no. immigrate. So most people agreed. Do you have any yes, other issues? Yes, I had with one. That? I had one other de- uh, declension. Uh, sure, that sounds wonderful. It, <laughs> um, from um, someone in the UK who didn't want to be associated with a film that was um, uh, that they had seen the um, they had seen the the trailer that I had made for Kickstarter that showed things like um, democratization of typography, like dry transfer typography. And to them, that was like low brow design and they didn't want to be associated with that. That was the only, most people were very welcoming. I did some, um, I, for uh, Tobias Ferrer Jones, I, 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 I sort of like did a sneaky, he was at a conference and I, I was in the in the sort of back uh, green room area to to interview Ellen and to interview um, others, and I was so scared to go talk to him. But I was like, "This is it. This is your chance. Just go ask him." I had emailed and I hadn't heard back. I'm like, "I know he's busy," um, but he had some great things to say too. So I was really glad that he he was generous to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, just yeah, everyone was so kind um with with it so you so you talked a little bit about editing and cutting some things out like did you have find that you had so many interviews with so many people because people were so welcoming that you had to cut at least parts of interviews out oh. um and or, oh, or, so whole little, or whole interviews out yeah. uh one or two whole interviews but um yeah most of what they said didn't make it into the movie yeah Oh, I can so imagine. So my, yeah. That was what I was imagining. I just wanted to say my advice to you is to, like, at first I would have conversations with people, but it became very quick that I learned, and I learned this from my um, from my cinematographer who also did the audio, that it's not a conversation, it's an interview. And so you have to be, like, asking questions and moving it along. And even Doug told me this, too, and I got it pretty quickly that, you probably want to only have 20 to 25 minutes of, of video because you're going to drive your editor nuts. Oh, from the actual interview, sit down. Yeah. yeah. Cause someone yeah. has to listen and, and you want to find the, you know, you don't want to have hours of audio to go through. Right. And I can, yeah. and, you know, I can give you some of the nuts and bolts of like how I did that with my amazing editor, um, Emily Von W. Gilbert. I mean, she's absolutely a collaborator on this. It, Excellent. Yeah. We'll we'll definitely be in touch with you throughout this entire process. Yeah. Maybe even Doug. Maybe we'll even reach out to him too and and uh, see if he's got any advice. Hey, I, um, so as you're as you're going through all of these old processes and technologies of, you know, graphic design, when it comes to the different professions and who did them, did you come across any kind of gender disparity oh, yeah. in, in the design field. Can you tell us a little bit about what that Well, the first like? one that shocked me was actually a, uh, it was that there were actually a lot of women in cold type setting. So it was, it was, a, it was that there were large numbers of women in cold type setting, but what I found out in interviewing um, <clears throat> uh, Patty Gable, um, you may remember she has the purple hair and she's darling, and she says that her her paycheck would have a slash and say slash two, which meant her paycheck was half of what the uh, hot typesetter in her same shop was paid. Oh wow! So that so uh, that I had to pause. And then I was like, 
Patty, are you fucking kidding me? I couldn't believe it. Um, so, so first I learned that there were more women just by when I was doing my call, looking for typesetters on Twitter and all over, I kept get, saying, oh yeah, I know this person. I know this person. And they, the, the names kept, kept coming back. They were all women. I was like, whoa, this is so cool. Then I, you know, and I talked to, I talked to, um, um, Frank and he, you know, he confirmed that this is, you know, and he talked about it with me too, that this is definitely a phenomenon. Obviously, you know, it's in step with the women's uh, liberation movement and, and things like that. Um, so there was that. And then, um, definitely, um, you know, you may remember that also April Griman talks about some disparities, um, in, in the eighties. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop with the typesetters. Right. Um, and some people talked about it more, you know, that wasn't what my film was about, but it definitely was like a parallel. Um, and this didn't make it into the, um, the film itself, but it is in, um, Frank Romano's book, um, about photo typesetting that, um, some of the early, um, union bus, the early union busters for, um, newspapers when the linotype operators would go on strike sometimes the union busters were women who had type typing skills and um you know that's you know say what you want but they're they're trying to make a living too and right. so um there's some sort of gendered issues um there as well did you come across anything that kind of separated genres so the difference between let's say newspaper versus a magazine um versus a design agency you know because well, yeah i mean that's that's the hard thing with the technology focus of my film is that the newspapers were sort of what was driving a lot of the technology um to progress so that they could bust the unions kind of mm. uh, in a way so there's that whole thing going on like um, your average designer didn't know this stuff was going on. Right. So right. that was the other thing I had to balance. Like how much of this union stuff do I cover? Hmm, um, sure. You know, that's not covered in linotype, for instance, the film linotype. So like I, I sort of had to decide like how much of this gets covered. Right. Um, Important to make I an think, awareness of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the human, I mean, one thing that Doug told me and, and he, he sort of said that his, editor told him this or a cinematographer i forget which one don't get lost in the technology or your obsession with the technology the humans are the story right so like in your case it it might be a, a case of like don't get lost in the, the obsession with the design or the first woman this the first woman that but more like the stories of the women right right you know it's it's right. the humanity that we care about and the stories more than anything so I did think you that's a great piece of advice. Did you then see you know as you're talking about these different areas newspaper, magazines, design agencies between April Greenman and the other women that were in graphic means was there greater uh presence of gender disparity or women in design in let's say the not so glamorous genre of of graphic design like newspapers versus you know, the design agencies that were? I think there were, um, well, production. I mean, if you want to, yeah. if, if that, that, that's, is that what you mean? Production? I think so. Yeah. Well, like, so typesetting, there were a lot of women and women owned typesetting businesses. Like I think that if, if someone was to do a study, I think they might find, this is anecdotal, but, but a lot of typesetters that I've talked to have said, I, owned a typesetting business. I know so-and-so owned a typesetting business. So a lot of women-owned typesetting businesses. I think a lot of women were production designers. Um, and so, like, in like not in the positions where they were getting, you know, credit, you know, for designs. Um, but I do think, and I think that many people, I think this is sort of common agreement now that, like, the emergence of digital design, in the emergence of digital design women were lead, kind of leading the way there. I mean, there were, there were some, there were some men that were also, but I mean, if you're looking at, you know, people like Griman and Skolos and 
um, Muriel uh, Cooper. And I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's a right. number of women who are just sort of like pushing things in a, in a way um, that's pretty amazing. So that's also fascinating to me. Right. Um, and that seems to line up with the kind of what I've sort of been studying about women and their, their contributions. And like, I can't remember where I read this, but I read somewhere that when the typewriter was invented, that women predominantly took up the role as typists. So I yeah. could see where that would translate maybe into like typesetting. Um, and, right. um, and then, you know, like you were talking about like the, their role in production and how um, it's not necessarily the glamorous side and they're not getting credit, but that seems to be like the story of women throughout history is like, you know, women can take up space in these lower roles, but when it gets into the higher roles, that's, that's limited to men. Right. It's harder to push through to the visible spaces and to the spaces where you're like in more control. I suggest um, both, uh, Ellen Lepton's book, um, it's one of her first books about women and machines. Oh, Mechanical Brides? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, the recent book um, that's kind of uh, about women and um, uh, and typesetting unions. And it's, a, it, you know, the one I'm talking about? That's natural em- Enemies of Books? Yeah, Natural yeah. Enemies of Books, yeah. So, so Well done. Mandy. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I have them. I haven't read them yet. They're still yeah. on my list. I mean, the mechanical brides will speak to some of that tra- trajectory of um, women and the typewriter, um, and you can then you'll and you'll see more about this sort of thing about women and and typesetting and how in the you know seventies and eighties. I mean, a lot of it was just the fact that those machines became more. They, they didn't have to be in unions and the machines became more uh, um, affordable. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So um, I guess we'll transition just a little bit. I want to talk to you. And I, uh, again, I think we've kind of hinted about this a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the value of graphic design history, its role in education? And um, the big question I want to ask is, do you think it's problematic that some design programs do not offer instruction in graphic design history? Well, I definitely think design history is very important. I am sad I didn't have it. I also think that it's possible that it was still something that um, design programs were figuring out. Um, You know, it was like 10 years, 12 years after Megs had published his book. But um, I think it's important because, of course, it's important to know where you came from, not only um, to understand why you're doing what you're doing, um, but um, to understand the contexts for why things were, were done. Um, and um, I also think just to have a pride in, in your own discipline and what you have done. Um, obviously, this is a common refrain nowadays, but representation also matters. And so um, that's why, you know, it's important in, you know, what you're doing in making films and, and in publishing and doing new um, original research to expand history so that we're not continually just re uh, printing and publishing the same people again and again, that one person decided um, were the best. Um, instead of understanding graphic design as um, not just something that is about, you know, only formal beauty, but also something that's just about human uh, and human social interactions. Like these are just pieces that we use in our day to day. Um, sometimes they're not always, um, you know, I mean, yes, I have beautiful posters that I love, but there's more to it than that. Uh, I mean, this book, I'm so excited about this book about what democracy looked like. Ooh. <laughs> um, it's all about ballots, um, American ballots from the 19th century. You know, this is what helps us understand as we move forward and have to um, design for everything from the government to um, nonprofits, et cetera. So um, that's why I think... Uh, it is important. And actually to come back to your question about 
choosing who, why did I choose the people that I chose? I chose people I admired, but I also chose with an eye to, um, representation as well. Um, and, uh, so you might notice that there are a lot of women in my film. Um, and that was, that was intentional. Are there, so the, the idea of it being problematic or is it, or is it not just kind of leave that question kind of open-ended? Oh yeah. Um, if, if there is a, um, if there isn't a graphic design history, uh, in someone's, uh, program, Mm -hmm. whether it's a student or a faculty member, do you have any suggestions for them to follow or, or Mm -hmm. ways they can still, um, get that in content, get that important information? Well, I didn't have it. So it's not, it's, you're not, uh, it's not a lost cause by any means. <laughs> I'm self-taught on it and I'm constantly learning myself. I'm constantly updating my curriculum. Um, so that, and all that means is I'm reading and learning more things and then I'm sharing them with my students. I mean, it's just simple as that. Um, but I, if, if you want a book to read, um, I would suggest the, uh, critical history of graphic design, the Drucker McVarish book. I think it's the best, uh, example of a book that looks at the context of graphic design. Did I say that title right? I think it's pretty close. It's like critical guide to graphic design history or something like that. Yeah. It's very close. Um, and then, um, but I would also, um, Mostly I would um, follow, you know, along on uh, online and, and sort of follow the threads that interest you the most. Right. Um, you know, and that will just sort of lead you in a path. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you, you follow this thread and then you get interested in that thread and that thread connects to the other thread. Um, so that's a less sort of uh, um, <clears throat> deliberate method. But if you don't have time to sit down and read a textbook, that's one thing that you could do. Yeah. So like following the letter form archive, you can follow the people's graphic design <laughs> archive. Um, you, you know, there are so many people that are sharing incredible um, historical content and it's just like injected into you every day. Um, that's, what, that's what I would do. So that's do you what think, I do. Uh, so I've done a lot of research and trying to find assets or tools for historiographic design, things that I could pass on to my students. Um, And I will say that I was very, very discouraged with the amount of video content that was available. It was really kind of sad. So I think a lot of the content that's out there is is kind of push-pull, right? Which is which? The stuff that you have to go dig out, is that the, is that the pull content or is that the push? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Someone can clarify that for me later. <laughs> but, you know, it's it seems a lot more difficult, obviously, to kind of go find these things and, and dig them up versus like anything that's being pushed out to you through Instagram or Facebook. Sure. Um, people's archive are, is there any thoughts or plans on how that might interject with social media and that how that stuff's kind of pushed out to the audience so there's you know less less of the the dig from the viewers i mean right now we're sharing a couple of highlights each day Mm -hmm. um with some context um we're also inviting people to um share bits of their own research that we would uh post on the blog um but um i also we're also going to post some information about how to use the archive in your history class. So for instance, yeah, one of the things that I do with my history class, for instance, is have them write Instagram histories, which I call them mini histories where they choose a topic and um, they write a short history, something more, you know, a little more palatable for them to start with. And it's in a format that they're, you know, that is comfortable for them and exciting for them to share their piece of writing and images 
And they can do it on, you know, they can do it on something, you know, very commonly associated with graphic design like April Griman or, you know, something that they've been sort of interested in that maybe they never thought about think, um, putting within the graphic design context, like the Honda logo that this has always, they've always admired on their motorbike or something, you know, so, and then they do some research on that. So um, that has been a fun way to engage the students a little bit more. And so now I'm going to sort of work on how do I get them onto the archive then to choose a piece on there and do some further research on, um, on a piece from the archive um, or having them upload a piece to the archive, right, for instance, right. um, things like that. That sounds really neat. I like it. And then, and then it, and then it's like we, sh then it gets shared with our students, and so our students get little history injections as well. So I'm just going to pivot us a little bit back to the the making of our documentary film. We're asking mm -hmm. this question pretty much of of everyone that we're we're interviewing in this series, mm -hmm. um, because we see you as part of our target audience. So, mm -hmm. what would you like to see? What topics or issues would you like to see addressed in a documentary film about women in graphic design history? <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm interested to see um, women talk about their experiences working in a studio. Um, so it doesn't have to be famous women. Um, I think sometimes we get obsessed with the, the fame and the, the achievements. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of women doing it in the 60s and 70s. They just didn't get a name out there. And it doesn't matter if they were p doing paste up or, or typesetting or whatever. So... I think that's something I would like to see um, and sort of something that I explored in graphic means, but I think that could always be explored further is the hierarchies like you were talking about. Um, and I mean, I was interested in the sort of the hierarchy of the typesetter uh, among all of them, but this would be more about women within the, the hierarchy of the studio setting, I guess. Um, so, but also, you know, yeah, how, how did a woman, you know, progress to uh, that place um, when it wasn't necessarily something that was encouraged, um, especially, yeah. So I think that that's something I would be excited to see. Um, and, hmm. I mean, I, I'm always loving archival imagery and things like that. So Me too. anything that's like, you know, coming from the, the people themselves is, is really fun to see. Um, but I think, you know, it's, 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 I guess it sort of depends on, you know, it's like, what is that, is the aim of the movie to like tell the whole story of women in graphic design, like how far back are mm. you going? To be um, determined. <laughs> right. We're still figuring all of this out. We, one of the things we did decide to narrow it down and, and uh, this honestly had a lot to do with trying to narrow the scope and budget. We are narrowing it down to women in graphic design history in America. But again, that okay. was so that we don't have to like fly to England and, and you know, anywhere, you right. know, the whole world because. Right. And the, Europe is like a, another story. I mean, Russia, I think they were letting, I think women have more, I think things were like, like the avant-garde that I think women were able to do more than they were here, for instance. Mm, and Yeah. And I think the other thing is um, who we can get in contact with to find out how much information back they can, they can get. I would love right. to go back to industrial revolution you know, when, when, um, wood type and, and printing and hand setting type was really big in the 1920s, even to learn a little bit more about what happened during wartime. And if that changed anything, you know, it'd be great to kind of see if we can get to some of those stories. But I, th I think those are going to be really difficult to kind of work our way through back to kind of find that information if it was even documented. 
you know, so it's going to be a lot well, of stories. So there, yeah, I mean, this is, and yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there's definitely a lot of women that were like printing in the colonial era and, and there are these stories. The thing is you have to get someone to tell them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Tell them in an yeah. interest. You, you have to have a Frank Romano. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. We need, hey, look, okay. We need to find a rank Frank Romano. Who is that going to be for us? Ah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Everybody email us or comment in the podcast on you YouTube a, or somewhere yeah, on my website. A dynamic historian of women in printing. Right, right. Um, hey, let me let me ask you to do some storytelling. How's that? <laughs> so what was it like for you as a woman in design when you first started out? Um... I started out at Discovery Channel Retail Headquarters, okay. and it was actually pretty good. I had a, a my boss was a woman. She took care of me. Um, you know, I was like 21, and um, I was there for about a year, year and a half, and then I saw this job for a part time job as as um, as art director at Bitch Magazine. I went and applied for the job, got the job, and then I went to my boss at uh, Discovery and I said, can I just work part-time and keep this job and then take this part-time job at, the, at this feminist magazine? And she said, yes, and in fact, I'm going to keep your salary the same. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was amazing. How that sounds amazing. amazing. <laughs> yeah. What about a work life balance? It was it was good. It was I mean I was young. Remember I was like 22, yeah. 23. So it was okay. Um, you know, they were both part-time jobs. Yeah. So, um, uh, Bitch Magazine is a quarterly magazine. Now, did so, the work life balance change for you as It did. So then, you know, eventually I went to get my master's degree. I came back and then I was doing I came back and eventually got back into doing Bitch Magazine and doing freelance and um, adjunct teaching. And then I was feeling, whoa, this is too much. And I felt I was starting to be like, wow, um, I feel connected to this educational community. And that's when I had to leave the magazine, which is hard okay. because those people are amazing. Like that place is amazing, but I'm still very close with the co-founder and we, that's why I moved up to Portland, actually. I moved with the magazine. Okay, okay. Yeah. And it sounds like you, yeah, you still re retain a connection to them because didn't you oh, say yeah. you, you were with them, you got disconnected, then you kind of came back again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They had gotten another art director and um, he was there for a while and then he was ready to move on. It, it's, not a, it's not a job you get to get paid real well. Right. You get it because you enjoy it. And so... When I came back, I was like, well, now I'm doing freelance. I no longer have a, um, you know, a cush, um, you know, corporate job, but I'm doing freelance so I can do this again. And I love, I mean, there's nothing like working with, you know, people who think like you, have the same politics as you. And, you know, it was a great job. So I took it back. <laughs> yeah. Um, sounds more like a work work balance. That a work life yeah. balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Brad just worked yeah, and worked. By the time and I was balancing the three, I was like, this is too much. My brain, like, I was just driving between all these different things. And I was like, this makes, I make little money between three jobs. It's like too much. Yeah. 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 Hey, what about uh, problems, um, issues, things we should oh. be looking for in a documentary film um, as, as we're going through? this particular topic are the things that you could see as like whoa watch 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 out there don't yeah. be careful don't go down that road or anything like um, that well i mean i guess just make sure that when people are talking to you you know what is on the record um that oh, wasn't really that's an a issue. really good point actually it is yeah, because yeah. somebody could be telling you a story and you're like, oh, okay. But then if yeah. you actually go back and look at the facts, it's not quite exactly that. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really have an issue with that. I think I had one interview where I was like, "This, some of this stuff is kind of juicy and I don't know if they really want this in the film, but mostly it was not an issue. So um, that is 
one thing. Um, make mm-hmm. sure you back everything up at, right after the interview. <laughs> Save right after all, the interview, all footage back up immediately. Three, four did you times. lose any? Did you lose any interviews? No, but my my friend and uh, cinematographer made me do it. Like she taught okay. me well. Okay, yeah, good. good. I'm just good. telling you the things that they taught me. Yeah, no, that's yeah. great. It's great. Boy, I keep um, like going back to like fact checking. You know. Well, think- that was what I'm not. I'm not talking about fact checking. I'm just talking yeah. about. Um, I'm just talking about things that people say that they may not, may not really want, want to be out into the, you know, might be more personal. Mm, yeah. True. But okay. sure. Yes. Fact checking is also. also Did you important. get sign offs on everyone that was in the film? Did you show yeah. them their footage? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I don't think you. Yeah. yeah. You don't really need to do that. Yeah. Okay. With the documentary. I think it's up, up to the storyteller. I mean, they know yeah. they talk to you. Yeah. yeah. So. You always wonder, you they know, it's like, there. it's like how you, well, our documentary film and your documentary film aren't going to be this route, but you watch some of those and you're like, boy, they really weave that story just how they right. wanted it. Right. Know? I mean, and you can say like, look, I'm not, tr- this is not a gotcha kind of thing, yeah. but I don't even think your yeah. interviews are going to feel like that. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. They're really going to be like, my interviews were always just sort of joyful, like, you know. And then there was, then this machine came in and we were, you know, it was just very dorky right. conversations. For those that haven't watched it, you have to do yourself a solid and go watch right. graphic news. Right. And even to see Frank Romano's like entire life come to, like on fire and his excitement over it is just. He's a insane. gem. I, I was yeah. at, I actually went to the museum. He is the president, president of last summer and did research there. I just stayed there for a week and scanned things. And um, he basically took care of me while he would come in every l- at lunchtime and bring me a tray of food. <laughs> and uh, we'd eat dinner every night together and talk about the old times. And he's a, he's also like a mentor to me in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. That's great. The, the nerdiest moment was uh TypeCon in Seattle and, um, you, you, uh, what's that called? The teaser of the film. Uh-huh. You kind of let them play it, and uh, it was it was funny because everyone was in this small, tiny room that was that was so weird. It was so small, but if you looked at everyone's faces, it was like somebody just got their hands on this new gem of a movie around Christmas morning, and at the bottom of the Christmas tree. And everyone was just gathered around to see the reveal, and uh, it was such a cool moment. That's yeah, that was sure. a, that was a pretty early cut, but it was like semi early cut. But it was yeah, they put it on a tiny screen, so it was like it was like oh well, this will be better when you see it on a real <laughs> movie screen. Yeah, wait till you, I mean, it's pretty crazy when you see your movie on a real movie screen. It's like yeah, really cool. Yeah, hey, I didn't have the opportunity to see that, um, you know, in a theater setting. You know, the largest was in our um, uh, history room here on campus, you know, and that was that's, that's fairly large that's screen. But it's yeah. fun watching with other people who are, you know, parallel or designers to the industry, you know, part of the industry, because especially when they get the jokes and everything, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, my my great I think the biggest moment for me was I went to see it in at CCA in San Francisco and um, and the emigre folks showed up. And I was sitting like just behind them and they were cracking up. And I was, <laughs> I was like, I can die now. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. this is the best. Right. Great. It, it's not like when I'm sitting at home watching it and forcing my wife to sit and watch it with me. <laughs> oh, my yeah. boyfriend knows all the words. He quotes it all the time. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's hysterical. He, he's been to a million screenings. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Hey, before we uh, before we part ways, I um, always love to get some advice from our guests. So okay. it can be advice for students, young designers, educators, um, um, <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. Give us our, Just, your words of wisdom. Yeah. I think my I think the word of wis- the words of wisdom I have are to really be open to where your your journey can take you because uh, you may have some ideas of what your you know what studying design is and what it will what where it will take you but um i think maintaining an open mind 
um, it can lead you to some interesting places that may not lead to the title designer or graphic designer, but, um, but yet it, your design and your knowledge of design can really inform that in a, in a really interesting way. Oh, I like that. I it's like fantastic. that too. I think that's great. Well, thank you so much yes. for your time. We really appreciate it. And then I know uh, Pete and I plan to get back in touch with you soon to keep yeah. asking you questions about the, the whole yeah. process. Yeah. Yes. Well, good luck. Don't stop. Thank you. Can't stop. <laughs> no. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you later. You bet. Bye. Everyone take Bye. care. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode. The Design Deducts podcast can be found at designdeducts.com. That's D-E-S-I-G-N-D-E-D-U-X dot com, where you can listen to the podcast or watch the video version of the podcast, as well as find links to the guests and the topics discussed during each episode. The Design Dedux podcast can be found on most podcast listening platforms. You can join us on social media through Instagram and Twitter via at design underscore dedux on Facebook as Design Dedux Podcast, and join us on YouTube at Design Dedux for video versions of each episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, you can show your support on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash design underscore deducts. Once again, thanks for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again for the next episode.